For five centuries, the crossroads of Europe and Asia has been known as Istanbul. Once, it was called Constantinople. A Christian island in a Muslim sea, it withstood every assault by the warriors of Allah. In 1453, the Sultan besieged the city with a new army, men sworn to lay down their lives for him. An army of slaves, they were the sword of Allah and the scourge of Christendom. In the 15th century, Christian Europe stared into the face of unholy terror. Rising out of Asia Minor like a whirlwind, the Ottoman Turks stormed into Eastern Europe. City after city fell, Christians trembled, and the Pope called for a new crusade against the heretics of Islam. The Turks did not fear these holy warriors, for the Sultan had his own, his elite infantrymen, the Janissaries, respected by Muslims, dreaded by Christians, and surpassed by no one. Bukri Haidar was a Janissary, a slave, the personal property of the Sultan. Islamic law forbade enslaving Muslims, but not infidels. A 14th century Sultan spared the lives of Christian soldiers taken as prisoners of war in return for their unswerving loyalty. Legend has it that a holy man dubbed them Yenicheri, the new troop destined to spread terror wherever they went. These were the first Janissaries. Whenever the Turks invade foreign lands and capture their people, an imperial scribe follows immediately behind them, and whatever boys there are, he takes them all into the Janissaries and gives five gold pieces to each one and sends them across the sea. The Ottoman Empire was soon growing faster than its army. In 1438, the Sultan levied a tax on every Christian family under his rule. The payment, one of their sons. Every five years, the Sultan's representatives scoured the countryside to collect the tax. He could not take an only son, nor a gypsy, since gypsies were considered unreliable, but any other healthy boy between 8 and 18, like Bukri Haidar. From their Balkan villages, 2,000 recruits were marched hundreds of miles to the Sultan's court. At the Ottoman capital, Edirne, Bukri Haidar was rigorously tested in mind and body. How he fared would decide his service. The most gifted were sent to the Sultan's palace to be trained as his bodyguards. In time, many would lead his government and his army. The majority of slave boys were destined for the rank and file of the Janissary Corps. Bukri Haidar was first sent to the estate of a Turkish noble to work as a farmhand. There, he learned the Turkish language and faith, surrendering his Christian name for a Muslim one. Three or four years later, he returned to Edirne to learn a trade, masonry, carpentry, or blacksmithing. The future leaders of the Janissary Corps had a stricter education. Supervised by the chief eunuch, 
the boys were kept at the Sultan's palace under lock and key. For cadets like Bukri Haidar, training could continue for eight hard years. Wrestling, weightlifting, swordcraft, lance throwing, horsemanship, and archery. They have the adroitness to shoot their arrows so very accurately that they hardly ever fail to hit man or horse. In 1444, alarmed at the spread of the Muslim Empire, the Pope declared a holy war. Against the Crusaders, Bukri Haidar would put his long education to the test. At the Black Sea port of Varna, Christianity and Islam met in battle. The Christian leader, the King of Hungary, formed his lines. On his right, mercenaries and French knights. On his left, soldiers led by Vlad II, the father of Count Dracula. Across the field, the Sultan likewise placed himself in the center with his trusted janissaries. The janissaries before him, and behind them, the camels, and a trench is made up all around and a rampart heaped up next to it. The Christians attacked. They charged the Turkish right so fiercely that the line broke. On their left, the Turks counterattacked just as hard. the afternoon, and heads rolled on the field like pebbles. By evening, weakened and facing defeat, the Ottoman army took flight. Only the Janissaries remained. The Janissaries sought out a place at the foot of the mountains among some gorges and tall heather, so that the enemy could not notice that there was any trench before them. And leaving the first trenches, they pretended to take flight. As the Hungarian king pressed on, one of his generals tried to stop him. You don't want to fight the archers in the hills, for they will kill your horses and your men will be lost. No two Janissaries carried the same weapons, save for the bow. Bukri Haidar had long ago mastered the skill of archery. From far off, his arrows rained down on the Crusaders. The king marched straight upon them, wanting to crush them swiftly. Thus, this gorge became completely full of cavalry. Then, leaping out, the Janissaries beat them and killed them as they wished. In the thick of the fight, Bukri Haidar faced a resplendent knight. This Janissary, having noticed the fine armor and the feather and clasp on his helmet, cut off his head and brought it before the Sultan, and throwing it before him said, Fortunate Lord, here is the head of some famous enemy of yours. It was the King of Hungary. The Janissaries had routed the Christians. But the casualties were so terrible that the Sultan vowed, May Allah never grant me another such victory. Book 
Krihaidar was rewarded with promotion. Returning to his barracks, however, he lived a monastic life. As a slave, he was forbidden to drink, gamble, or marry. All his time was spent training for war. Better prospects would come only by distinguishing himself before his master, the Sultan. They have their task in common. At night, to lie near the Sultan and take the night watch silently. Rain or snow, winter or blizzard, each must remain in his place. Each night, fifty, and one hundred when necessary. Even slaves had to be kept satisfied if their loyalty was to be kept. Bukhra Haidar received an allowance for weapons, a bonus whenever a new sultan took power, and his regular wages. Wages are paid by the imperial court every quarter year in full and without fail, and it also gives them clothing once a year. The Sultan's money was well spent. Fear preceded the Janissaries. Victory followed. Their very music, crashing cymbals and pounding drums, was dreaded. Unstoppable, they swept through the Balkans like a scythe. Bukri Haidar served under a corporal in a squad of ten, with its own pack horse, tent, and treasury. They are diligent and get up early in the morning. They are frugal when on the road and live on only a little food, a little badly baked bread and some raw meat. Their camps were well kept, their latrines well ordered, their ranks well disciplined. Cowardice, disobedience, and desertion were punished by death. Yet so devoted were the Janissaries to Allah and each other that it was said 10,000 of them could be led by a thread. Nine years after the Battle of Varna, the Janissaries came to the last bastion of Christendom in the east, Constantinople. Like his forefathers, the new Sultan, Mehmet II, had long eyed this prize. Thirty years before, his father had tried to take the city and failed. Mehmet would prepare better. In March 1452, Mehmet Bey the Turk set about building a fine castle six miles from Constantinople, towards the mouth of the Black Sea. It had 14 towers, of which the five principal ones were covered in lead and very strongly built and it was made for the express purpose of taking the city of Constantinople. Towering over the Straits of the Bosporus, this citadel blocked any ship from sailing into Constantinople. The Turks called their new fortress the Throat Cutter. Surrounded and outnumbered, the defenders of Constantinople placed their trust in a double wall, a hundred feet wide, surrounded by a moat. Against the Turks, it had always proved impregnable. By sea, the city was protected by only a single wall, but it too was unapproachable. A heavy iron chain slung across the narrow stretch of water called the Golden Horn sealed off the harbor from Turkish vessels. On April 2nd, 1453, the first troops came into sight of Constantinople. The Sultan approached and placed his forces so that they extended from one sea to another. On a hill near the city, the Sultan made his camp, ringed by thousands of his warriors. The ground was completely invisible, being covered with Turks, particularly the Janissaries, who were the fiercest of all the Turkish soldiers. The Turks unleashed a thunderous bombardment. Huge chunks of the city's walls collapsed. 
Under cover of darkness, the defenders rebuilt them. The Turks fared no better by sea. Their first attempt to capture the Golden Horn ended in disaster. Christian galleys showered them with burning arrows. Many ships were lost, along with 12,000 men. Enraged, the Sultan had his admiral deposed and flogged, and distributed his possessions among the Janissaries. As dawn broke on April 22nd, the Christians in Constantinople witnessed an act of sorcery. Boats sailing on land. Since Mehmet's ships could not get past the chain guarding the Golden Horn, they would go around it. With horror, the Christians watched as the Turkish fleet slithered into their harbor. Bukri Haidar knew the great assault was coming. His spirit soared. Allah would make a special place in paradise for the first Muslim to set foot in Constantinople. All night, the Janissaries prayed and celebrated. One hour after dark, the Turks began to light a terrifying number of fires, much greater than they had lit on the two previous nights. But worse than this, was their shouting, which was more than we Christians could bear. At dawn, they heard a chilling sound. The Janissary musicians beating out the march of attack. day came, the cymbals began to sound and the pipers and trumpeters joined in, giving the signal for assault. After several hours of desperate fighting, the first wave gave up, exhausted. The Sultan turned to his Janissaries. My Janissaries, my children, you have shown your bravery wherever I have campaigned. Now, it is through you that the city will be captured. All now hung on them. They advanced, not rushing like the others, but keeping their ranks in perfect order in the face of arrows and stones, unbroken, undaunted. The Sultan himself rode out with a great array of troops. He chose to fight in front of the breach in the walls with a contingent of brave young Janissaries. And there were more than 10,000 of them fighting with the courage of lions. Vying for glory, the Janissaries hacked their way through the breach. Christians were pitted against the Christian born, now fighting for Islam. The cry went up, the city is taken. Having won honor, the Janissaries now sought plunder. Decades later, the Turks would still refer to men who owned wealth above their station as one who took part in the siege of Constantinople. The Sultan moved the Ottoman capital to Constantinople, renamed it Istanbul, and ushered in a golden age for the empire. Mehmet built a magnificent palace called Topkapi. In its outer courtyards, the Janissaries trained. The empire grew ever larger, the demand for soldiers still greater. The Sultan needed more troops than the tax on Christian boys could supply. 
by 1600, Turkish citizens were recruited into the Janissary Corps. Soon, most were not converts like Bukri Haidar, but native Muslims. The esprit of the Sultan's slaves was broken, their loyalty corrupted. For the next three centuries, the Janissaries dominated not the battlefield, but the court, fabricating intrigues with the women of the harem and plotting to assassinate sultans. In 1826, when the reigning sultan tried to abolish the corps, the Janissaries revolted. The sultan retaliated by wheeling his cannon up to their barracks and opening fire. Most of the Janissaries were killed. The rest were taken to the public square and executed. What the sultan had created, he destroyed. An army of slaves serving no one but him.